under the sweltering Vietnamese sun, bad boy Sergeant Joe Hooper and the rest of the motley bunch of outsiders who made up the U.S. infantry company known as the Delta Raiders cautiously approached a river deep in the heart of the torrid jungle on the hunt for their communist enemy. Suddenly, a deafening hail of screaming rockets and staccato machine gun fire coming from the opposite shore let them know that they had found them. Diving for cover among the tangled undergrowth, squad leader Hooper's voice pierced through the cacophony as he rallied a handful of his most fearless troops for a daring assault on the North Vietnamese army bunkers, charging as fast as they could through the river's chest-deep waters to engage their opponents in a frenzied firefight. Amidst the raging chaos of battle, the intrepid Hooper and his men successfully took out the first bunker, then another, and another, until five bunkers had been laid to waste. Emboldened by Hooper's success, the rest of Delta Company surged forward to join the fray, only to be met by a ferocious storm of North Vietnamese bullets, which would send several members of the company falling to the jungle floor in agony. Witnessing the carnage as he continued his attack, Sergeant Hooper knew what he had to do. He may have been labeled a troublemaker and a miscreant, but he wasn't a coward, and he certainly wasn't going to abandon his wounded comrades to their fate. The North Vietnamese were pulling no punches with their intense onslaught. With a complete disregard for his own life, he ventured once more into the inferno of enemy fire, determined to save as many American soldiers as he could, no matter the cost. Today's exploration of Captain Joe Hooper's valiant actions during the Vietnam War is sponsored by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. From the pioneering biplanes of early aviation history to the cutting-edge advanced fighter jets of the present, take command of more than 2,500 vehicles, aircraft, helicopters, and naval vessels from 10 leading nations, all of which encompass a full century of technological innovation and advancements. Immerse yourself in War Thunder, where the game's lifelike graphics and genuine sound effects transport you into the heart of combat with the world's most impressive war machines. And join a community of over 70 million players engaging in PvP battles, featuring content of unparalleled quality. War Thunder also offers extensive customization options, including historical markings, paint jobs, and decorations, providing an unprecedented experience of warfare. And when it comes to gameplay, all you need is a mouse and keyboard or a game controller. There's no need for any costly extra hardware. Our favorite part, as military history enthusiasts, is the thorough attention to detail. Every vehicle is faithfully modeled on its real-world counterpart, from the engines and fuel tanks down to their very vulnerabilities. Prepare for battle with War Thunder, available for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. Enlist now by clicking the link in the pinned comment or the description below and secure your massive bonus pack, exclusive to new and returning players who haven't played in at least six months. You're in for a real treat. Claim the Eagle of Valor, premium vehicles, 100,000 silver lions, and a seven-day premium account pass accessible across all platforms. But beware, this offer is for a limited time only. Act fast, warriors. Join the ranks today. Joe Ronnie Hooper was born in Piedmont, South Carolina on August 8, 1938, into a family struggling with poverty and an alcoholic father. Growing up without a strong role model at home, Hooper looked up to Hollywood tough guys and rebels like John Wayne and James Dean, and soon enough, he'd earned himself a reputation as a problem child who often found himself getting into fights. As a teenage tearaway, always on the lookout for adventures and a chance to prove his mettle, and having already learned how to look after himself from a young age, it came as no great surprise when Hooper dropped out of high school to join the U.S. Navy in 1956. Although he found boot camp difficult at first, the Navy provided Hooper with some much-needed discipline. Once his training was complete, he was assigned to the Essex-class carrier USS Wasp as an airman apprentice, showing great promise during his first year, leading to a promotion to airman and reassignment to USS Hancock, another Essex-class carrier. While his commitment and natural leadership skills allowed him to become a plane captain on the Sky Raider, one of the Navy's most successful attack aircraft, Hooper's wild streak would soon resurface, spending all night at bars and frequently getting into scrapes. By the summer of 1959, Hooper, having married, chose not to re-enlist in the Navy. Transitioning to civilian life proved challenging. He was dissatisfied with his job as a cookware salesman, and his marriage quickly deteriorated resulting in a divorce after just seven months. Giving civilian life one last shot, he got a job at a factory, but he soon realized it wasn't for him and decided to re-enlist in the Navy. However, when he found his local Navy recruitment office closed, he headed to the Army one across the street instead, joining up on May 31, 1960 as a private first class. 
On completing his training the following year, Hooper shipped out to South Korea, which had retained a strong American presence since the end of the Korean War in 1953. With no real military action to speak of, he spent his days drinking and fighting, and often found himself getting into trouble with his superiors, on one occasion receiving an Article 15 for leaving his post without being properly relieved. Nonetheless, he was much happier in the army than at home, and despite his misbehavior, he was eventually promoted to sergeant. Leaving Korea in November 1963, he returned to the United States for further training at bases in Texas, Kentucky, and North Carolina. His reckless lifestyle and devil-may-care attitude continued to cause him problems, including dismissal from some of the training activities, but once again, his potential did not go unnoticed, and he received a further promotion to staff sergeant in September 1966. However, after reassignment to Panama, his poor conduct seemed to worsen even further. He was given a second Article 15 and was demoted to sergeant for missing a reveille before picking up a third Article 15 soon afterwards for going AWOL. Another instance of going AWOL just a month later would earn him a summary court-martial and a further demotion to corporal. While boredom on base had fueled his bad behavior, his chance to get on the battlefield would soon come giving him the opportunity to finally prove his true worth as a soldier. With U.S. involvement in Vietnam stepping up after the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, the demand for troops was constantly increasing. As a result, by summer 1967, the Pentagon had authorized the creation of a fourth rifle company for each of the battalions of the 101st Airborne Division, enabling three companies to head out to attack enemy positions while the fourth defended the firebase. On September 9, 1967, Hooper was assigned to the 4th Company of the 2nd 501st Infantry Regiment under the command of Captain Charles Wayne McMenemy. Like Hooper, many of the soldiers in the New Delta Company came from troubled backgrounds, often displaying unruly behavior and a lack of discipline. Indeed, their favorite pastime of stealing training equipment from other companies would soon earn them the nickname of the Delta Raiders. However, McMenemy was determined to forge the ragtag group into a well-oiled fighting machine, capable of facing the challenges ahead of them in Vietnam. He insisted on a grueling training regimen that would see them running five miles where other units would run two, and going out to practice maneuvers at night while other companies were sleeping. Though somewhat extreme, the hard work paid off when Delta Company received the highest ratings during all battalion evaluations and won all competitions prior to deploying to Vietnam. During these six intense weeks of training, Hooper stood out to Captain McMenemy, who promoted him back to sergeant before a Delta Company shipped out to Southeast Asia, landing on December 18th. Upon arrival in Vietnam, Hooper and the Delta Raiders primarily found themselves conducting search and destroy missions, in which they would be sent into hostile territory to seek out and neutralize any enemy targets before quickly withdrawing. On one such mission, on February 21st, 1968, Delta Company was heading south towards the city of Huey. Huey was in the throes of a fierce battle that had begun three weeks previously as part of the Tet Offensive, in which North Vietnamese forces took advantage of the fact that many of their South Vietnamese counterparts would be celebrating the Lunar New Year to launch a vicious surprise attack across the country. Making their way through the torrid jungle, the Delta Raiders came across some articles that had been cast off the previous night by members of the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA. Based on the quantity of items they had found, they estimated that the unit had to be made up of about a hundred troops. They knew danger was nearby, but little did they realize just how close it was. Reaching a river moments later, they were immediately greeted by a barrage of rockets and machine gun fire from enemy bunkers on the opposite bank. Having taken cover, Sergeant Hooper and another squad leader began rallying a group of soldiers to charge across the chest deep river in a bold counterattack. Reaching the other side, they successfully neutralized five bunkers, inspiring the rest of the company to follow them. However, the NDA held firm, and before long, several GIs had been hit. Without a moment's thought, Sergeant Hooper jumped out into the line of fire to start hauling the injured men out of the danger zone. Having successfully retrieved one casualty, he headed out to rescue a second. However, this time he was the one on the receiving end of enemy gunfire. The wounded, it would take far more than that to stop Hooper from completing his mission to save as many GIs as he could. Carrying the soldier to the medics, he refused to let them treat his own injuries, instead rushing back to his men. Returning to the front, Hooper provided covering fire, 
as a scout set out to determine the source of the relentless assault. Moments later, the scout was back and could point out the location of a trio of menacing bunkers ahead. In another impressive display of valor, Sergeant Hooper sprang into action, armed with nothing but his rifle and a clutch of hand grenades, which he used in combination to great effect, eliminating the three bunkers one by one, before heading back to check the status of his platoon. But as Hooper made his way back to friendly lines, three North Vietnamese fighters appeared out of the blue, launching a savage attack which left the unit's chaplain badly wounded. Reacting at lightning speed, Hooper once again came to his men's defense, taking out two of the three enemy soldiers before evacuating the chaplain for medical aid. The tide of battle now turned. Hooper led his men in a methodical sweep of the area. Seeing the NBA troops rushing into houses for cover, he grabbed a light anti-tank weapon and one at a time began reducing the houses to rubble, neutralizing the enemy soldiers hiding within them. Eventually making it to a small bunker line, Hooper jumped into the trench to assess the situation. Out of nowhere, an NBA officer came lunging towards him. Hooper was out of ammo, but still had his bayonet, which he deftly employed to see off his attacker in hand-to-hand -hand combat. On leaving the trench, Sergeant Hooper saw his unit was locked in a bitter shootout with North Vietnamese soldiers holed up in another small house. Without batting an eyelid, he charged the building with a handful of grenades. While this successfully eliminated the enemy, it also left him with further wounds as a result of grenade fragments. Though he was once again offered medical attention, Hooper continued to turn it down, determined to maintain his focus on winning the battle. Approaching the final line of resistance, the platoon found themselves subjected to a brutal attack from four bunkers on their left flank. Thinking on his feet, Hooper grabbed another sergeant and went sprinting down the enemy trench line, throwing a grenade in each bunker as they ran past. After taking out another bunker with an incendiary grenade, he neutralized two more with rifle fire. Meanwhile, a group of GIs had ended up trapped in a nearby trench as enemy machine gun fire chattered above them, some of them badly wounded. Once more, Hooper went into hero mode, barely pausing for breath before rushing to their aid. On his way to rescue the men, he was intercepted by an NBA soldier who burst out of hiding with a fierce attack. Without breaking a sweat, Hooper calmly whipped out a pistol and did away with his assailant before moving his comrade to safety. He then proceeded to run down the final stretch of trench, taking out three more enemy officers with rifle fire as he did so. Taking his troops forward to establish a final line, Hooper surveyed the battlefield, still declining medical aid, until his men had reorganized and distributed their ammunition in anticipation of another attack. But none was forthcoming. Thanks to his heroic actions, the NBA unit had been completely wiped out, with Hooper himself personally responsible for eliminating an estimated 23 enemy soldiers that day. Returning from South Vietnam, Hooper was discharged in June 1968 before re-enlisting in September of that year as a public relations specialist. The following year, he went to the White House to receive his Medal of Honor from President Richard Nixon. His outstanding bravery in Vietnam also earned him two Silver Stars, six Bronze Stars, eight Purple Hearts, the Presidential Unit Citation, the Vietnam Service Medal with six Campaign Stars, and the Combat Infantryman Badge. Once finding himself constantly reprimanded for his raucous behavior, Hooper remarkably ended up becoming one of the most decorated soldiers in the Vietnam War. He was one of only three wounded in action eight times during the conflict. He's credited with eliminating an impressive 115 enemy soldiers. After another stint in Panama and a second tour of Vietnam, Hooper remained in the military, serving as a training instructor before joining the Army Reserve. Finally leaving service in September 1978, he passed away just nine months later at the tender age of 40. Nevertheless, his incredible feats on the battlefield would forever be remembered by those who fought with him, especially those who owed their life to his noble deeds. A big thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring our video. Dive into the battlefield at no cost on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox by clicking the link below. And if you're new or making a comeback after six months, don't miss out on grabbing that massive bonus pack. Your arsenal awaits. Deploy now.